Teaching Learning and Outreach at Caltech. We are so happy to be partnering with the Hickson Writing Center for this series and to be welcoming our panelists, whom you'll hear more about in just a moment. Um, the act of writing and communicating, especially speaking to the public, has so much overlap with teaching and with wanting to learn about the universe in which we live. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're so excited. Please enjoy today. Um, Suzanne Hall will walk you through our next steps. Dr. 
Dr. Guri is a theoretical physicist who works on quantum field theory, quantum gravity, and superstring theory. Using mathematics, he seeks to develop new theoretical tools that will enable us to more fully answer fundamental questions about the matter in our universe. In 2014, Dr. Oguri received Japan's Kodansha Prize for science books for his Japanese language book, Introduction to Superstring Theory. And this book was the final installment in a trilogy that Oguri wrote uh, called Forces in Nature, which also included the books What is Gravity and Strong Force and Weak Force. That series has sold over a quarter of a million copies in Japan. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over first to Dr. Brown. And as I said, each of them will talk for a little while. But, but think of questions that you have for them, because we should have plenty of time for them at the end. Uh, let's have a warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming. And it's uh, it's really fun to get a chance to actually talk about writing books, which is uh, something that uh, that usually you might maybe talk about the, the, the science behind it, or I talk about the the overall story, but I don't really talk about the, the writing itself. And so when Suzanne asked us to, to uh, be on this panel, she said that, that uh, she wanted us to talk a little bit about why we chose to write these books, maybe a little bit about what it was like to do and and uh, what. What it has happened since. So I'm going to start with, with why I, I chose to write a, a popular level book on the, on the discoveries and on the motion of Eris. And it really all started um, because I love to write. And I, I love to write, uh, not, I mean, writing scientific papers is okay. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I actually love, I love to read and I love to write more, uh, more literary things than your typical scientific. Papers. And I actually took um, writing classes when I was in graduate school. You know, it was, it was a great time. You're in graduate school, your advisor doesn't really know what you're doing most of the time. And so you pretend like you're working and you go off and you take classes uh, in, in other fields entirely. And so I, I took a whole series of classes in, in writing at, at Berkeley with the idea, it was sort of crazy at the time, but the idea that when I, when I finished my PhD, I would make a choice whether I was going to go into writing or go into science. Um, and it turns out, it's, it's, you never really make that choice because when you finish your PhD, you're kind of on this track and, and it's, it's a lot easier to do science than it is to do writing. Um, so, I, you know, you kind of fall into a postdoc and you fall into a job and, and you, you work for a while and you realize, you know, I never really did that writing thing that I was interested in. And so I, I knew that at some point I wanted to, to, to do some full-length writing, do some book writing in my, in my career. But I also knew that as a, as a scientist, I was a, had a great opportunity to do it. You know, the, the typical person on the street, if they decide to sit down and write a book, they, they might not have very much interest in to write about, but the typical person, I would say, in this room probably has interesting scientific things to write out. So I knew it was a great opportunity. And then, you know, you, you, it's hard when you are presented something as, as ridiculously publicly accessible as killing Pluto, you know, you kind of have to go write a book. That's a requirement. So um, you don't have to call it something as, as, uh, as lurid as how I killed Pluto and why I had it coming. But it was such a, such a good uh, title that I couldn't really resist. The title actually came from um, a student at uh, Loyola Marymount College. I gave a talk, and the talk was called something like Pluto and Eris and the Dwarf Planets of the Outer Solar System, and nobody came to the talk. It was, it was a great talk, trust me. <laughs> but nobody was there, and I, I was asking some of the students later why nobody was there, and they're like, God, because the title was so boring. If you just called it, I don't know, how I killed Pluto and why I had it coming. Everybody would have a steal it. So a good title is definitely a good thing. So, so I decided to write this book, and it, it went in uh, a couple of stages. I, I started several years earlier than I, I eventually ended up finishing, and started and, and didn't know what I was doing. It took a long time and sort of stopped a quarter of the way through. And, and then I actually spent a long time 
as silly as it sounds, I spent a long time um, writing blog posts. I, in, a, in a very systematic way, I, I forced myself to write uh, a, what I like to think of as a well-written thousand-word blog post once a week with no excuses for not doing it. And that was one of the most useful pre-book writing exercises that I did. When I was finally back to ready to write the book, I found that I could sustain that level of writing. You know, the, the big difference between book writing, full-length book writing, and the, the sort of writing that we all do all the time, proposals and, and papers and, and here and there, is just the sustained aspect of it. You know, you finish a paper after a couple of weeks and a couple of thousand words, and you know, after a couple of weeks and a couple of thousand words, you you're, have barely made a dent into the book that you have promised someone you're going to have finished by a certain date. And it, it required a, an incredibly new level of discipline that I had never had. You know, I did what people who write books do, apparently. You always hear that they, you know, write a certain number of words per day or at a certain time. My, my uh, technique was get up, go to work, check on what's going on in my office, and then leave immediately. Um, I walked down the street to Pete's. Most of my book was written in Pete's coffee um, from the hours of 9 to about 11.30 every day for about six months. Uh, I, was, I was a fixture with anybody who was ever in Pete's coffee and everything. Really see the back of my head. And that's what I had to do. I had to do it every day for about that length of time to get through the number of words. It's just an incredible amount uh, for me. It was, it, was, it was just shocked at how long it took. It was also just a pleasure. This is one thing I didn't know whether it be fun or tedious to do, and I found the writing incredibly pleasurable. Uh, I found the, the editing process Afterward, also just fabulous. A good editor is, I, I'm telling you, grad students, a good editor is, is a, a fabulous thing. You learn so much about your own writing and your own silly tics and how to be better from a good editor. Uh, take a good editor seriously. You can ignore the bad editors, and they're lying about their probably your faculty advisors are all terrible editors. Don't, don't believe anything they say. No, but, but find a good editor and have them edit your papers. It's just, it's, it's a pleasure. Everything after that moment, from, from the writing to the editing, when it was sort of out of my hands, was just about the most tedious thing that you could imagine. You know, the uh, waiting months and months for it finally to get published, and then uh, going around and, I don't know, I, I don't mind giving talks about the science and it was fun, but uh, I just I didn't actually enjoy the post book part as much as I did, which is perhaps why I'm not been rushing to go uh, I might one of these things uh, because the writing was so much fun, but uh, I would really have to hand it to something um, quite uh, fabulous like the, the, uh, the killing of Pluto again, I think. So um, my, my 10 minutes is almost up. I just want to say one of, one, of the, um, one of the real reasons I chose to write the type of book I did, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, Quite unscientific book, and it's not has no equations, has has no deep science, and it's more of a memoir than, than a lot of science. But it includes it's, it's very accessible to non-scientific people, and it without um, them noticing it, they actually learn a lot of science while doing it. So I, I think of it as part of the educational process, part of my outreach process, trying to get science out to the rest of the world without them really knowing it, which uh, I think works really well in these one of these types of memoirs. The people who liked it the most, I think, were the, were the total non-scientists who were surprised at how much they liked it. The people who liked it the least were the really engaged, like, amateur astronomers who just wanted to science, and they were, like, really pissed off, and I got married in the middle of it, and I had to talk about it. And, uh, <laughs> so, you know, and it was hard to read those comments all the time, and, and uh, but you, you get over it eventually, and you realize that not everybody's going to love the style that you do. Uh, but that was, it, it, it was, I think, worked well for that. I think it did bring a lot of people in, and a lot of people are now still very engaged in, in what's going on in the solar system, what's going on in the other solar system. So I, I enjoyed uh, the, the aftermath um, greatly, and, uh, you know, someday I might actually do it. Questions that I think uh, are most likely to be on people's 
lives. Uh, one of those questions is, will writing a popular book hurt my career as a scientist? <laughs> the other is, how do I get on the New York Times bestseller? <laughs> so uh, for the first one, will writing a popular book hurt my career as a scientist? Yes, it will. That is the short answer. The slightly longer answer is yes and no, but it's not a sort of fuzzy yes and no. There's very specific examples of why yes and why no. Writing a popular book will, all else being equal, hurt your career as a professional scientist within academia. If you think about climbing up the ladder from graduate student to postdoc to junior faculty to tenure faculty to member of the National Academy, uh, there's a lot of people who want to climb up that ladder, and there are very few slots for those people. So whether we like it or not, there's a competition, there's a sorting that goes on. And by spending time writing a popular book, you can be good for the world, but you're also letting the people above you who will be judging you know that there's something in life you enjoy doing other than doing scientific research. <laughs> All else being equal, that counts against you in a very, very explicit way. That's not to say you shouldn't do it. If you're passionate about doing it, uh, then you have to be who you are. But you should know that all else being equal, you know, the probability of ascending to the next level is decreased rather than increased by having a big popular book on your resume. That's why almost all great popular books in science get written by people with tenure, because that is how you can really be comfortable that you know, at least you won't be fired if you write a popular book. Uh, the no part of the answer is, of course, there is a world outside of academia. And outside of academia, having written a book counts an enormous amount. Uh, people outside academia don't understand that, especially in science, most of our work is done by writing papers. Like, if you want to, uh, if, if someone, if Ridley Scott wants to make a movie and he needs a science consultant, and someone suggests your name, Ridley Scott's question is going to be, well, what book have they written? And you're like, well, now they haven't written books, they've written science papers, they've been great, they've revolutionized the field, like, no, they're not interested. Outside of academia, like in the world of policy making or industry or the tech world or Hollywood or whatever, having written a book is a very tangible thing that people can really glom on. If your book is successful, you have a good chance of knowing once you've written it what the first sentence of your obituary is going to be. Person X, author of this book. You can hold it in your hands, you can give it to your mom for Christmas, you can sign <laughs> copies of it after giving public talks. So in that aspect, it helps you hear quite a bit if you think that that's an important part of your career. But don't be tricked into thinking that the uh, hiring committee of the physics department at Harvard is going to say, well, this person's written a popular book about quantum mechanics. That's why we should hire them for our next junior faculty. That never, ever happens. The other question is, how do I get on the New York Times bestseller list? And the answer to that is, you should not be asking that question. That is the wrong question to be asking. I remember I was at, um, the Institute for Theoretical Physics at uh, UC Santa Barbara at one point, at the you know, the and Coffee Institute, named after the same person who uh, is, is Rosie's uh, chair in our, Craig Coffey. And uh, we had a journalist in residence there, Rosalind Reed, who organized a little workshop on writing popular books. And this was, I forget what the year was, but it was right after Brian Greene had written The Elegant Universe. And The Elegant Universe was this runaway bestseller. Everyone was surprised. A book about string theory is there, you know, the top of the New York Times bestseller list. And Brian was nice enough to sort of offer his advice or wisdom or whatever, just like we're doing here about writing popular books. And he has a room full of physicists who want to write a popular book. And all of the questions were about how do I get an agent? How do I pick a clever title? How do I, you know, get on the Colbert Report and things like that? Nobody asked Brian, how do I write a good book? Because, plus their hearts, they're academics, they think that part is easy, writing a good book, how hard can that be? <laughs> so the answer to the question of how to get a New York Times bestseller list is first, ask about writing a good book. It is hard to write a good book. I mean, I'm, I'm someone like Mike, but I really love the actual act of writing. And that's a very personal thing. I know many people who are professional writers who do nothing but write about science, they're not scientists, they write about science for a living, and they hate writing books. That, that's the sort of this torture, it's like 100,000 words ahead of them, they can't quite take it. And there's other personality types who like nothing more than to be able to say, finally, I can get this right. All those people have been writing about this for years and getting it wrong, and I will get it right, and that's the fun part of it. But there's a skill to it. There are things you have not thought of when it comes to writing a book. There are different ways to write books. There are different sort of angles to take. You can take sort of an explanatory angle where you're really trying to get into the ideas and the top concepts in whatever scientific area you're writing about. 
Uh, for a lot of readers, they don't want that. I mean, they want to be explained things. What they really want is a little bit of the behind the scenes writing, the human aspect of it. And it turns out that they're writing that little behind the scenes human aspect stuff. I'm terrible. I mean, I'm really bad at it. So I know this with my wife, Jennifer Ouellette, is a real science writer. And she sort of dragged me by the hand to try to do it a little bit. And it was torture, and I didn't really like it. Mike is very, very good at it. His book is actually, you know, that's really the, what sparkles in that book. But you've got to figure out what you're good at and write that kind of book. And you've got to figure out what the audience wants and try to sort of, hopefully there's an intersection of the books that you might write and the books that the audiences might someday want to read. And try to find that intersection and work at it. And realize that the style that works for academic papers is not the style that works for popular books. The style that works for giving talks is not the same. The audience does not start from the same place you do. I mean, it's not just this sort of uh, knowledge deficit. They don't know what you do. They think they know some things. I mean, the audience is never a complete blank slate. Audiences have been reading New York Times, Science Times, or listening to Science Friday or whatever. You need to somehow, of the many, many, many books that are written every year, get them interested in yours by picking an angle they haven't thought of. It's exactly what Mike was saying about the title of the book. That's half of the battle. Jennifer, my wife, was on the uh, jury for the LA Times Book Festival Science Book Prize. Every year they give out a prize for the best science book of the year. And you might think so, what, 20, 30 good science books? No, there's over 100 good science books every year just nominated for the LA Times Book Prize. Forget the ones that didn't make it to that, to that stage. There's a huge number of books written. It's very depressing to see all these books. And as a writer, you're like, no one will ever read my book, even all these books. So the, the advice for the second part of the question is you really have to respect the craft of writing the book. You can't just say, well, I have a good story, I know some science, I will you know, dumb it down and make it clear, and that will be fine. There's a lot more to it. You have to be in the right place. You have to be able to hit the right notes with your voice. You have to be able to put up with editing, as Mike says. You have to like, let your friends read the book and give you comments and actually listen to the comments they give you. Um, and it's fun and it's extremely educational to do it right, but it is, it is just as much a craft that, is, that takes time to master and is worth mastering as actually doing science.
one package. But then uh, there was a new child, so I, uh, I had a daughter, and she was born in Pasadena, but she's bilingual, so she went to uh, the Japanese school on the weekend. And uh, so at the commencement, uh, I was asked to do some speech. So I gave a speech, and so basically I told them, well, it's great to be bilingual. You can think about things in different ways, and I quote it, say, for example, Sharman, who said that uh, uh, to, have, to, to, to be able to speak two languages, like to have two souls. So, and then I said that, well, but then there's yet another language, which is a language to describe you, which is mathematics, which you are proficient in mathematics, which is pretty good. So, I wrote about, after I had a blog in the news, so I posted the speech to the blog, and then I had a good place to contact me, and I asked her that I wanted to expand on that, and the uh, work to the So, so I, I started out writing, contributing some kind of uh, bi weekly column. And this was a sort of fashion of the magazine. The rest of the article was a fashion of the magazine. So, but I feel like uh, uh, I came to some very fashionable party in the school. But it was quite, quite popular. And uh, so I, I, uh, so I put out uh, 80 stories. And uh, it was just like my writing book. And uh, so I turned it to nine uh, uh, stories uh, about Bayesian statistics and prime number and how I say public key. And, uh, Geometry and how you measure, how you measure the size of the universe and the equal thickness of it and God was a way of all these kinds of things. So, so as I was writing the book, my daughter was actually a prime boarding school in this course. So, so this was sort of my letter to say that for all of this course, so I just ran into the stuff I had. It just came out of the last month in the prime boarding school, a top selling book in mathematics. So it came out very uh, well. Uh, so, so I, I thought I should make, make, maybe say a few words about uh, what are the sort of challenges. For example, uh, Suzanne asked, asked when I was going back to uh, give this uh, uh, public uh, sort of panel discussion. So by discussion, one of which was how is the process of writing the popular of different languages. And of course, they are very different. Uh, in my case, uh, my book is mostly about theoretical physics, and of course, mathematics is a basic language. The Feynman said that uh, to those who do not know mathematics, it is difficult to get that close a real feeling as to the beauty, the deepest beauty of nature. And I'm totally can't yeah, because in popular science book, we are not, we can't really use equations, right? But he said that every equation costs half of the audience. If you have, <laughs> <laughs> if you have one equation, you have 50%. If you have uh, two, you have quarter, etc. In my first book, I had one equation at the top expense of uh, half of the audience that was also in the system. And uh, so it's a limitation. On the other hand, if you, of course, write a, a research article, you can use everything. You can, you can, you can employ any means that are available to human civilization to make your case. So, so it's a very different uh, audience. And, uh, but I think one important thing is to respect your reader and try to give convincing arguments. So, for example, in the, at the end of my first popular book, uh, I tried to explain, so when I write a book, I sort of have in my audience. For example, in my last book about mathematics, I had in mind my, my daughter going to this course. And uh, so, so afterward, uh, my first popular book, I wrote that, uh, when I wrote this book, I had in mind meeting with a high school classmate for the first time in 30 years after graduation. He had a different career path and is working in the area far away from science, but it is still, he's still as curious as he was when he was in high school and was open to convincing argument. I wrote this book for this high school classmate to explain to him what I learned at the university, what I studied in graduate school, and what I have been thinking. So, so it was like that. So I had this particular friend in mind, and uh, he's not a scientist, but I wanted to explain to him what is gravity. And so that, 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 that was my book. And uh, of course, uh, uh, to, to explain things without the uh, equation of mathematics, you have to employ analogy. And I think that's where, so, so, uh, so maybe I should say, uh, of course, there are professional writers and they are great, uh, uh, they, they, they are great, they do great service to uh, uh, outside outreach, but there are some benefits of uh, uh, Writing, and I think there are at least two. One is that uh, 
we can come up with some interesting analogies. So for example, uh, so when uh, I can tell, for example, whether a particular analogy is a good one or not without consulting anybody. When, <laughs> when I uh, 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 take a long walk with my student postdoc or cloud writers, we talk about physics and mathematics, but we can write long equations and we try to explain, discuss things using analogy. So I try to use those uh, uh, in, my, in my group. And uh, so I, can, I try to come up with a new way of explaining this. So that was fun. So there was one part of the writing to try to come up with a new way of uh, explaining things. And uh, the other is that uh, uh, each researcher, he or she, has a sort of particular passion and prejudice. And so, so it, it comes to speak uh, in the good uh, science books, uh, popular science books, those uh, books come through. And, uh, so I think uh, uh, those are sort of benefits of uh, 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 professional research to uh, uh, writing. And uh, in my case, uh, of course, uh, my special is research and presentation student. And so, so I only do that after dinner, try to. So uh, <laughs> it's not always possible. Uh, when the book was to be published and completed, uh, I have to spend quite a bit more time uh, editing and uh, uh, refining. And, uh, but other than that, uh, I try to limit uh, this to. Uh, public outreach is important, but I, uh, uh, my, my day job is uh, research and education, so, so that's how I. So the time is sort of mostly in a precious commodity, and so I try to do it. So that's all.
for my next research and what, what to think about that in sort of a global scheme thing. And uh, they, uh, take, uh, the, the actual process of writing is very different to well, us. Sean said, uh, when I write a technical article, I can employ any method I like. And in some sense, uh, it's easier because uh, I can just explain the way that I thought about it and uh, my potential reader has all the same sets of tools that I have. Uh, in the case of uh, popular writing, I have to be more creative and find a uh, different way of explaining things and the way that I originally thought So, so that would be, to me, rather different way of Pressing, and uh, it's a very good mental gymnastic to, to try to do both. Yeah, I should just talk about that also. It's certainly true for me that the academic popular writing has had a huge effect on what research that I do. The act of sort of putting into a bigger picture, looking back, you know, because when you're training as a grad student, there's something that before you were a grad student, you, you couldn't do anything as a theoretical physicist. And after you're a grad student, there's one thing you can do really, really well. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very tempting to keep doing that thing for decades. And the, the standing back and putting it in perspective and figuring out what are the deep questions that really got you into this when you were 12 years old in the first place can be rekindled by that popular way. Okay, so say you have your great idea for a book and you want to write it and you want to find out how you actually start going and finding editors. What's the process like you're actually going? So I would say getting an agent is the single most important thing. Don't think that you can write a popular book and get it published without an agent. Because you can. You can just publish it yourself. Because Amazon will publish anything for you and you pay them. If you're serious and you read your book, get an agent. Uh, publishers are not in the business of listening to authors, bitch ideas. But agents are. So when you have a, an idea, you write a proposal. You say, this is what I want to write about. Here's the outline for the book. Here's why it's an interesting book. Here's my own personal story. You send it to an agent, they will laugh at how bad and pitiful it is, but they will help you fix it, or they will say, this is just unfixable. Most of the time, they will say, this is unfixable. And I got turned down by many agents before I finally found them. But that is the first step that gets you over. The answer to that is obviously no. Um, you, I mean, there, there are copious examples of science writers who don't have or or have been in writing school, like Sean Clark, for example. Um, don't you use that? Uh, it's, that said, it's a great background you have if you want to be writing about science. Um, I think you can understand things in a different way, and it's a good way to do it. It's absolutely not necessary. Yeah, so there's a, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with my, but there's a difference. So that, that would be a different, namely, the qualification of PhD is to discover something in science that adds something to the scientific knowledge. And uh, so that experience helps in the sense that, for example, if you want to write some particular area that you, you have worked on, you have a passion, and you, you have a new, different perspective to tell. And uh, so in my case, that's what I did. But, uh, that's not all science writing is about, and uh, uh, that certainly is not qualification. There are great science writers uh, who can write in areas that he or she has not worked on, and uh, that's a skill that I don't have uh, to do science writing. Um, as a person who had English as a second language um, and issues with reading all of my life, I became an artist. However, I also had uh, a circle of notes that were electrical engineers, so I had a thorough understanding of things in quantum electrodynamics. And one thing that motivated me to continue focusing on my hobby study were comic books of quantum physics, comic books of astrophysics, um, electricity, whatever. Do the three of you have um, any, perhaps, future intentions of creating comic books for the masses of people that came here, that want to grow up and become researchers one day, but are in a public school system where that is no longer an option, whereas the comic book 
would allow that student to continue that daydream and possibly realize it. I haven't personally had that ambition, but I think it's, it's an awesome ambition. I'm just very, very much a believer in diversifying different kinds of media that we use to reach out to people. So that's why I think it's important to write blogs and Twitter and give talks and do courses for the teaching company and, and uh, as well as writing books and so forth. And I think that, yeah, comic books, graphic novels, um, little YouTube videos, little apps for your iPad, I think all of these are fantastic ways of reaching different audiences. And I think that the internet, you know, it's tough for professional writers because there's so much content out there that it's hard to make a living providing it. But for the consumer, you know, it's, it's you know, a lot of variety of ways to get them. And I think it's just going to become more and more. Uh, one thing I can say is that uh, writing a book here will give you credential, as uh, 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 Sean said. So I often get asked to advise or consult on, so I'm not going to write comic books or I'm not going to make videos, but uh, I have been helping people to do those things and uh, uh, ensuring scientific accuracy of these uh, activities. So, so for example, I have been helping uh, uh, the science museums and planetariums to make uh, movies, uh, even 3D movies, and uh, I have uh, been helping some, in fact, uh, novelists uh, to, to, to write some uh, uh, popular science books or science themed uh, books. And, uh, so I don't have skills, so I'm not going to do that myself, but I can help the other people uh, uh, make more scientifically accurate presentation uh, in these different things. Hmm. Um, so there's a lot of subtleties and intricacies that can go into science. So I'm wondering how do you balance that with the need to kind of generalize and summarize when you write for a couple? Yeah, that requires like a, a six lecture course, not a <laughs> answer. But, um, you know, while it's hard and everyone does it differently, which is why it's, it's good, there's a lot of different books out there. I think that, uh, you know, I really feel that, well, like, like I said in, 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 at the start, people don't come from zero, right? Everyone you're talking to knows something or thinks they know something. You know, they have some, some beliefs. And your goal is to take whatever place they are and move them to a place that is closer to the truth. And I, I, I say it's very really explicitly because there's a lot of places that take as their goal saying things that could be construed as truth, <laughs> even though they won't be construed as true by many people reading them. I mean, uh, uh, the example still bugs me from a couple years ago was Stephen Hawking wrote a paper that got promulgated in the media as Stephen Hawking doesn't believe in black holes anymore. And that's because there was a sentence in Hawking's paper that says, in this sense, there are black holes do not really exist. And then the very next sentence, here is the sentence in which they do exist. So that doesn't get no in there. So I think that you, it, it's always possible to find a way to say things that are strictly speaking true. But the art is to figure out what people already have in mind and sort of use the language they start with and move them in the direction of, of what is slightly more true. And sometimes it, you, know, you need to sort of have a little agreement with your audience that it's not going to be easy. We're going to have to like suspend our disbelief in some commonsensical things if we're talking about space time and long mechanics and things like that. But for every person, it will be different. So writing a book is a bit hard that way. But there's nothing like talking to actual people and finding out what they believe to figure out how to do that. Good question.
days when my daughter was taking afternoon naps, which is a regularly scheduled occurrence, and I knew I had a couple of hours to run um, You know, as, as a scientist now, I have a hard time sitting down writing a paper because I don't have the discipline that I have when I have a book. So most of the time I write a paper, I take my laptop with a piece and write it there. Um, I don't know, does anybody know? Better than peace. That's better than There's an app for the Macintosh called Freedom, which will, which will cut off your internet connection. So you can set it for like, all right, two hours, I'm not going to be able to get on the internet. And if you can't stop the app, you need to actually reboot your computer to get it on. So that is my one piece of it. I'd say that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, going somewhere is, is a, a good solution, is like I don't get internet there. I'm just sitting there. I can't, even my mind doesn't have that distraction. I've got every five seconds, like, oh, what about you? Oh. And that finally turns off, and you can write and say. I wish I knew. But again, I'll just emphasize once more the plurality of options. I mean, these guys are both way more disciplined than I am. I'm like, you know, in any 15 minute block of a day, I'm not quite sure what it is that we do. So someday I'll be writing paper. popular science books, I mentally kind of classify them into books that try and explain theories, uh, that really try and explain science and discoveries or nature or something like that. And the other set is books that are really telling the story of scientists or, or the story of how that discovery came to be or how that invention came to be. Why do you think it's difficult to kind of combine those two modes of writing and, and why haven't I read any good books that combine the two of those in, into into one thing? You know, I, I certainly know uh, the styles that you're talking about. There's the sort of historic, this is the way that this science developed, and then there's the, you know, let's sit down and teach you the science. Uh, I, I don't think that there is, that there's a lack of a middle ground in there. I do think there are books out there that will give you a narrative on on someone doing something or something happening, and uh, also can do a very good job on describing what the science is. I, you're, I think you're right that those two, those two other styles are quite common. I don't think the other one is not there. Comic books was originally a nurse 
and in the she eventually got promoted to a doctor. But for the movies, they wanted to beef up her role, so they wanted her to be some kind of scientist. So we consulted with the people at Marvel about like what kind of scientist should she be, what kind of science should she do. Like we decided that she was a sort of a theoretical astroparticle physicist with some aspirations to uh, collect data as well. And kind of thought about where all of it. But there's some awesome background material on Jane Foster's character, and I think that that's much more what we have to offer as science writers. I mean, we're, they don't want us to fact check their movies. You know, if, you, if the star of your movie is an Asgardian who comes down with a giant hammer and smashes things, getting the laws of physics right is not your primary <laughs> concern. But getting something in the spirit of how science is done might be. So I think that's more what we have to offer. about the editing process. Um, one, if you could pick one thing that you wrote that you more or less fell in love with, but the editor wanted you to take out, can you tell me, A, did it actually end up in the book or not? And B, are you happy or dissatisfied with that? I, I also, as, as, as I told you, I, I love the editing. Um, there were there were sections that my editor, who, you know, you have to trust your editor, and I, my editor was, I, I think, fabulous, and she made changes, you know, as as small as punctuation uh, and and small word uh, order to ordering of sections or even excising of sections, and there was one that's your example perfectly. I I. Love this section of the really I thought it was just some of the best stuff I've written, and she just put a big red red ink through it. And I, I didn't think twice. I just took it out. Um, I just trusted her. She knows books a lot more than I do, and everything she did, I think, was good. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I also have a great important because, as uh, Sean was saying, uh, it's very important to understand your audience, and but the aim, your aim is to improve their understanding a little bit more in a precise way. So you need to know what, 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 what who you are talking about. I, I, I don't know, so she knows. And uh, uh, the other issue is that I tend to write longer articles than necessary. I, I like writing a lot, and so, so my, my explanation tend to be wordy, and uh, uh, also I try to too many things in it, and uh, she needed to clear up what is unnecessary for the only to do it. So, so I really trust her that we do that. So it's very important to uh, get this kind of second opinion. Uh, in front of me, uh, people who don't have a science background, my editor is a sociology, but a sociology major. And uh, uh, so, uh, and then sometimes I, I can say that, and then you get some other occasion for different volumes, so, so I don't get hard very much, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's important. Okay. I, just, I just want to amend a little bit of what I said. There were times that she would excise something because she didn't like it, and I realized that it, it, I had been trying to say something I hadn't said, but I still wanted to say that same thing. So I really wrote it instead of just saying okay, so, so, I mean, But understanding that she was not getting it, I trusted that she didn't get it for some reason and did something with it. I think for me, it's what happens to me more frequently is I will write something out of a sense of obligation. It's like, oh, I'm talking about particle accelerators. I better tell them about every particle accelerator that's ever been built. <laughs> and the editor will go, no, 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 no. That was the most boring part of the thing I never read. I didn't answer. Um, so that's, but the more important lesson is that you do need other readers. You need people other than yourself, because you are inside it. And so my strategy is much more um, while I'm writing, sending out every chapter I write to a dozen different people, friends of mine, and say, like, this makes sense, you know, experts in the field and complete non-experts, people I've never even met, people who friended me on Facebook and seem to like science, and like, you read this chapter because I'm a scientist and you read this one. So, on behalf of the Hinson Writing Center, I'd like to thank Dr. Let us know, we'll continue this series.